Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a Center of the American West event in the Modern Indian Identity Series. Our speaker tonight, Charlotte Rodrigue, Rodrigue uh, has lived a very interesting life. And she was living a very interesting life on January 2nd, 2016. She did not need to have any particular escalation in the interest of her life. She had, uh, she's a, of the Burns Paiute people who have been in that area for hundreds and hundreds of years with a very, very vast and comprehensive terrain that was their home. She was um, in a boarding school, two different boarding schools as a child, and those are remarkable stories. I'm kind of seating you for questions so that if, if we don't get all this covered, you know what's, what uh, you might want to ask about. She went uh, to the University of Denver for a year, and she was in Denver during the American Indian Movement times, and so that's some interesting stories right there. She uh, went to college, then became uh, a specialist over a little bit of time in mental health and substance abuse, and in many ways saw the the lingering and lasting impacts of conquest of the European invasion and conquest in that in that mode. She uh, play, I left out one important thing that the Burns Paiute people were not federally recognized, um, and therefore did not were not eligible for quite a number of important services. In 1968, with Charlotte playing a part in that, they did get federal recognition. So there's another important story. Then, on January 2nd, 2016, some people who were not from the area, but who felt that they would be able to represent locals anyway, which is a little bit of a very deep fantasy on their part to think that they could make that change. The Bundys and their followers came in and uh, took over the Malheur uh, National Wildlife Refuge and stayed and stayed. Out of that, one person died. Lavoy Finnegan was killed by Oregon State Troopers in a kind of standoff on January 26th. The bright moment for many of us, it didn't look like it was going to have bright moments. And in January 6th, I think it was, it was four days after the takeover, the New York Times ran a story about a press conference held by the Burns Paiute people, including the chairwoman, Charlotte Roderick. And I happened to be attending a conference of historians, and those of us who were Western historians were running into each other at the hotel saying, did you see that story today? Did you see that wonderful occasion where this person stood up and spoke with great forthrightness and humor about the takeover? Um, and that was just a lodestone through the whole episode. So she has, um, was it eight years on the tribal council? Six, six, six years, six or seven. Um, might have felt like 15, I suppose, by some. So, so and, and then was tribal chairwoman at the time of the, of the takeover, and it is um, one of the high points for the Center of the American West, over many years of high points, to have this particular visitor, Chairwoman Charlotte Rodrigue. I appreciate the fact that um, everybody was able to come out this evening and you've got perfect weather for being out and about in the evening and I was really surprised by the weather. Uh, um, I wasn't prepared for warm weather, so. Uh, but anyway, you know, I do appreciate the chance to be here to address this group, and I appreciate your interest in the information um, involving the takeover, the occupation, and I think that, you know, the humor involved in it as a tribal person, you know, things may be hard and it may be uh, a difficult situation but usually we find humor in it and my humor on January 2nd and they had this rally downtown Burns is about oh between three and four thousand uh, people in population and the rally to support the um, 
Hammond family who were convicted of arson on federal lands and were being placed in federal prison in California. And the militia people came in supposedly to support those two individuals that were being taken to federal prison in California. Not one of the militia people went to California to protest their arrest or their incarceration. And as Patty mentioned, you know, being a young person back in the early 60s and uh, American Indian Movement was coming about, things weren't right for us. Uh, from our point of view, a lot of violence, a lot of things going on in tribal communities, bold decision was being made, all these things were happening. And um, you had, I guess, a feeling of a need to protect those tribal people who were being arrested, who were being hit with billy clubs, who were being knocked down under the buses and and things like that. And what we did in that day, we didn't have assault rifles, we didn't have anything. I said, we gathered around those people and didn't let the authorities take them without a really knock down, drag out kind of situation. And I said, you know, if these militant people with their assault rifles and their pistols and, and everything, really meant that they supported those people. I said they would have went to California and chained themselves across the gate to the federal facility. And I said they didn't care. I said those people left town and those guys went down to the refuge headquarters. And I said, you know, they, they made a big splash about the BLM is, is infringing on our rights as landowners and the government is against us. They're doing all these things to restrict our use of the lands and everything. And they're going to give it back to the rightful owners who are the ranchers. And uh, I watched all this stuff on the news and I was sitting there. And then I just kind of laughed to myself and... and uh, I told my son, who was there with me at the time, he's in his mid-twenties, and I told him, did you hear that? And he said, yeah. He said, the ranchers are our ancestors, and this land belongs to them, so we're ranchers. And we kind of <coughs> joked around about it a little bit, and I said, but that's not right. I said, we have for generations, for centuries. And just recently they're saying 14,000 years. And I said, our blood, the remains of our ancestors are in that land. And um, a friend of mine, who's a sixth generation homesteader in the area and you know, during the Bannock War, we burned a few of their buildings and ate a few of their cows and did these things, and they shot a few of us. And, you know, that stuff went on, you know, back in the late 1800s. But for this man who's 85 years old, and he says, you know, I'm six generations in this country. And he said, I know. He said, I've ridden as a buckaroo through this country. I know where those campsites are that are ancient. I've seen the petroglyphs. I understand what's on the ground there. You know, the, the archeological relics and things that I've seen. And he said, I rode through there as a kid. He said, I never told anybody about the things I saw, but I knew they were there. And he said, we're behind you 100%. And little by little, and it was these old generation 
branches that, you know, were our adversaries at one time that came forward in strength to support the efforts of the tribe. Not all of them, but most of them. And um, you know, it was hard. It was very hard for the community because you had not only the tribal people and their issue wasn't with us, it was with the BLM. And I kind of laughed about that too. I said, well, why do you want to occupy and your enemy is the BLM and you attack the Fish and Wildlife Service? And, uh, you know, and it, it was comical because they didn't know what they were doing. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with Eastern Oregon, but um, it's a very high altitude desert and forest lands and very cold. And last week, we our high temperature two days last week was four. And we've got about two feet of snow on the ground, or it was when we left the, yesterday. And it's very cold. And to see these people, you know, they're all camoed up and they got all these guns and everything, and they don't realize that you know, we're hungry, send us something. And they didn't realize the distance of the place they occupied from any place. There wasn't a Starbucks. There wasn't anything, you know, convenient for them. Uh, there were a lot of jackrabbits, which is one of our traditional sustenance. And they had assault rifles. I said, man, they could have had rabbit soup every day, but they didn't know how to do it. And... Uh, I said, you know, this thing that they did of intimidation to the community, where you have elderly, non-Indian people who have lived, you know, down by the park, was born in that house and still living there. And these people can't go to the store because they're afraid to go out and be intimidated by these people that have come into our community and disrupted everything. And, you know, and a few people had to stand up and make a stand and voice what these people couldn't talk about or didn't know how to talk about or were afraid to talk about. And we had several town hall meetings. Um, it was something. When you have a gymnasium full of people and you've got two doors at the other end of the gymnasium, you've got the county commissioners, the sheriff, tribal, everybody sitting in about 12 chairs at the other end of the gym and you've got all these uh, uh, militia people fully armed inside the school building with their own camera, their own cameraman, and they've got people that are representing them throughout the crowd. And one of the gentlemen got up and he was all camoed out and he, he made a statement about the tribe not having an interest, the tribe didn't need to be out there, those sorts of things. And I got a little bit hot under the collar, you know. <laughs> Most of the things you see with me, I'm a nice lady, somebody's grandma, and stuff. But that evening, my daughter said, Mom, she said, I was so afraid. She said, I didn't want you to get up. And the lady had the microphone, and she was going to the bleachers and letting people speak. I went out and took her microphone away from her. I went into the bleachers where this guy was heckling and chewed him out, and one of the FBI, in fact, the U.S. attorney, he was uh, there in the crowd, and they had a lot of FBI in there, you know, undercover people in the group. He said, when you went out there and you took that microphone and you told that guy off and he sat down and shut up, 
he said, I was so proud of you. And he said, and I just kind of felt relaxed, even though we had all these armed people standing at the other end and everything. But, you know, it was a very volatile situation. Anything could have happened. We had law enforcement that were being harassed. These people coming in and, and driving past their homes, parking in front of their homes, um, having to lock the schools down because these people were trying to come into the school through the back doors, um, having escorts for school buses because you didn't know if I were an FBI agent or a county deputy and my children were on that bus, are they going to stop that bus and take my kids off that bus? You know, it was at that level that our community lived for until these people went and were arrested. The day that, um, the day that um, Savoy Finif Finnegan was uh, shot. The tribe had written a letter to Governor Brown and requested that she do as much as she can to get this thing to stop. And um, of course, our letter, uh, people knew about the letter that the tribe had written. And so then it came back after he got shot that the tribe and Governor Brown were responsible for his death because the tribe requested Governor Brown had Oregon State Police shoot him, and it was done. And then came around to where they started to actually try to intimidate me. And uh, I talked to them this morning about the boarding school experience. You know, they would punish you and punish you and punish you. And you didn't give them the satisfaction of knowing that they hurt you. And, you know, and that kicks in every once in a while with tribal people who have had that boarding school experience. So that happened with me in the militia. The more they tried to intimidate, the more stubborn I got. And, you know, they were calling me up. Uh, I had to channel all my emails, uh, text messages through the FBI because of the attacks that were being made. And I actually got phone calls. And one guy armed and everything came to the community looking for me and wanting to know where I lived, whatever. And just so happened I was chairman of the Upper Snake River Tribes, which is the um, Shoshone Bannock, all the tribes along the northern, west, north western part of uh, the Snake River drainage. And I was at a meeting in Boise with them. And the receptionist at the health office where he was making all these demands on knowing where I was and where I lived and what my phone number was and everything. And the funny part of it was she said, I didn't know what to think or what to say. She said, and I was scared. And she said, he wanted your phone number, and he was getting very aggressive. And she said, I was looking at my computer monitor, and there's a property tag right up in the corner. And she said, that was your phone number. <laughs> and I was laughing, and, and she said, I don't know what made me think like that. She said, but I wasn't going to give him your phone number. And... But there were situations that were, I guess, um, really serious, really threats. And, you know, and I had several calls from several people from different bands of, 
of the Paiute country people, Northern California, Nevada, Southwestern Idaho. Um, they did their little YouTube thing and they had the arrowheads in a baggie and they were waving it in front of the camera and videotaping. This is how they take care of the relics and everything. And calling me and wanting me to go out there and pick up your artifacts. And I said, you know, I said, this country is covered with artifacts. And I said, what little piece of our history is in those boxes and on those shelves is not a drop in the bucket. I said, we have artifacts that are still sitting out there. There is a, a, a petroglyph that's probably 10 feet tall, 10 feet wide, and 10 feet thick. And I'm going to put that in my little Ford Ranger and drive off with it? I don't think so. <laughs> but, you know, they, they, they didn't have an understanding of what they were asking people to do. And I told them, I said, we respect the process of monitoring our artifacts and where our things are. I said, these are stone artifacts. I said, they're not organic. They're not baskets. They're not leatherwork. They're not anything that would be chewed up by mice or, or anything like that. I said, these are stone. And, I, and he complained about there being mouse turds in the boxes. I said, it, it, those things came from the desert. I said, they laid under sagebrush. I said, I'm sure that a chipmunk sat on it and ate something and left a dropping on it. I said, crows or whatever flying over dropped something on it. And I said, you know, when they're laying out there in the open exposed, I said, they're subject to all kinds of things. But it doesn't hurt the stone itself. And, you know, and for them to try to, you know, they were just trying to get somebody to react to them. And the less I reacted, the matter they got. And, you know, I felt the spirituality of tribal people and the amount of letters, the support that came from tribes all across the country, from indigenous people in South America. You know, we had two or three, I, know, I remember one from Peru, uh, talking about, you know, what was going on there. And, um, you know, to have to deal with that and to have to try to keep your own people because there's young people and, and they want to go out and bump heads and, and do whatever. And to try to keep those people at a level where we're rational, we're not getting shot. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was hard. It was really difficult. And, you know, and I think the prayers of the tribal people from across the country are the things that kept us focused, kept us mellow, so that we didn't cause a big blow up and make it worse than it was. A lot of people were upset because they didn't understand the strata of jurisdiction. You know, how come they don't send people out there and just do some? And this wasn't only tribal people. This was the general communities. Why are they just sitting down there, letting them go and not doing anything? Turn their power off. Turn off their communications. All of these things. And then it, it got into, if it was tribal people doing that, they would have been shut off a long time ago. And I said, if it was tribal people doing that, I said, they would have had roast rabbit and build a big fire and kept on going. And uh, I said, you know, but, but these um, militants, you know, they profess that they wanted something. They wanted it from the government. 
and felt they were entitled to it. And it wasn't realistic. You know, you've got to have some kind of plan. You don't just sign a deed and say, okay, this land belongs to whoever, just because it's public land. And, um, you know, and these, these guys just didn't seem to have a grasp. And I felt sort of torn because I know that as tribal people, we would have organized. We would have had a safety net. We would have had some contact with people in key places that would support us and help us. And it's not always good, but at least you know somebody that knows some. And, you know, for these guys, uh, me and one of the other tribal council members went to Coeur d'Alene. And uh, when we left, we came back and we left Spokane. I told her, I said, we'll pull off the freeway at truck stop down the road and gas up and go on. Um, when we got there, I'm a bad smoker. And I jumped out of the car and I went to the corner of the building where there was an ashtray. And I was smoking over there and there was a gentleman smoking on the other end. And she was gassing up and then she pulled up in front of the convenience store and went in. And there was this lady that came out of the, I don't remember if it was RVs or something, but she had a bag of food. And the man pointed our car, and it's got Burns Paiute Tribe and the big emblem and everything on the side. So she took a picture of that. Then he was pointing at something else. She went around the front, took a picture of our license plates. Um, they were driving a monster truck, big black Dodge with blacked out windows and rifles hanging in the gun rack and whatever. And they were lucky they went towards Idaho when they left because we were coming to Oregon. And I told Wanda, I said, you better be ready for those guys. I said, their, their truck is about as high as this car. <laughs> and I said, you'll know when they come up behind you. And she was saying, don't say that to me. And I said, you know, I said, we don't know who's out there yet. We don't what, know what kind of people are watching and still have feelings about things. And I said, we have to be aware and we have to be in tune with our surroundings and everything. But I, I think that the community, uh, because we've worked a long time on community conservation plans, wildlife, uh, vegetation, all the things that matter in this world and trying to protect them and encourage uh, people to be concerned about our environment and to pay attention to things that are happening because of climate change. And I know that when I spoke earlier, I talked about the drying up of the marshlands. Um, the rivers in our basin don't go to the Snake River. They don't run into the Pacific Ocean. They come into the valley in Malheur and Harney Lake. And there's no drainage any other place. So you have this big marshland in the southern part of the basin. And that's the wildlife refuge. And, you know, we've had floods back in the early 80s. There was a major flood when these lakes rose you know, probably six feet above what they had normally been. Uh, back when the removal of our tribal people from that area in order to open it to livestock companies and mining, what have you, uh, they took all of our people. And the ones they didn't kill, they forced into other areas. Most of our people went to Fort Simcoe in Washington. 
and were incarcerated there for a few years. And um, so then the big livestock companies say, it's not going to interrupt anything by us getting land grants out there because there aren't any Indians living there. You know, and we were all locked up in Washington or Vancouver, various places where they took our people. And, you know, and I'm always proud of the tenacity of the Paiute people in Oregon. Um, we had stories that have been handed down of one that always sticks with us is the three girls that came in the springtime across the Columbia River on a log and walked all the way back to the Harney Basin. And these girls hadn't reached puberty yet. And that's a tribal way of, of uh, describing, you know, what period of life people are in. And, you know, you're a kid before you reach puberty. And, uh, you know, any place you look at the stages of development, puberty is a time that makes a difference from what you are an adolescent or, you know, what, whatever. But these girls came across the Columbia River, which probably at high water is about two miles wide. Um, they made it across. Then they had to come all the way back because they had drifted probably 10, 15 miles past where they wanted to be. And for them to come in the springtime and survive on plants and things, I said, I wouldn't send my 16-year-old grandson up there in a car with a credit card. I said, he would get lost. And I said, but in those days, I said, because of the way we were taught, the things we learned as children, those girls were able to make it. And they made it all the way back. And it's a four-hour drive in a car. So, you know, you need to imagine, you know, how long it took them to walk. And, um, you know, and I, I, I really am proud of that ability, that strength that our people had, and that desire to be in their homeland. Um, we had people coming out of the woodworks from all around, and, and were the descendants of those people that decided to come back to the Harney Basin to make their homes there, to live there in spite of all the animosity, the, the lack of revenue, the lack of support. Um, we lived there for years and years and years. And like uh, Patty was saying, 1968, we became a federally recognized tribe. And I said, you know, there was no education assistance. There was no higher ed grants. There weren't any medical services. There wasn't anything for the Burns Paiute people. We identified as a tribe, and I said, I don't know how they put me in boarding school. If they didn't recognize as, us as a tribe, wasn't it kidnapping for them to come to my house and take me at five years old and haul me away and make me stay in a school that I didn't understand and, and stuff? And I said, and then I said, they did recognize us. They recognized us enough to move us out of that area. They recognized us enough to send us to boarding schools to do some of the things that uh, other tribes were doing, but we didn't have federal recognition. And I said, when it happened, uh, I was a young lady, I think I must have been about 21, working for the Burns Paiute Business Committee because we didn't have a tribal council, we didn't have a formal government at that point. And um, I was basically a transcriber and an interpreter. And um, 
all of a sudden, you know, the subject of becoming a recognized tribe came up. It was something we had been talking about. And then they said, you know, you've got a week to name your tribe, to get the paperwork in, uh, a resolution. All this stuff has to be in Washington. And in those days, there wasn't, we didn't have fax machines. There's no internet, no scanners, anything. And the rush was on. And they said, well, what, what are you going to be? And one of the bureau officials that was there said, well, you know, it's been the Burns Paiute colony. He said, we'll just call you the Burns Paiute tribe. So that's the way it went into Washington. That's the way it was published. And, you know, today we're known as the Burns Paiute tribe. But the majority of us that... Uh, um, come from traditional families, refer to ourselves as the Wadatka. The Wadatka is a small plant, similar to sage, sort of a purplish tint to it, and it has these little black seeds on it. Those were the seeds that were harvested by our people, and that was our primary food source. And any of you that are familiar with the Paiute people realize that uh, most of the tribes are known by their primary food source. You know, we have the Gitatukat, we have the Kuyuitukat, which are the big fish in Pyramid Lake. And um, there's a Gaitukat, there's, those are the salmon, the big cutthroat fish eaters. And then you have Pakwe, those are the trout eaters. And you have the Toy Tukat, which are the cattail eaters out in central Nevada and coming north. And every band is identified by their food source. And so we're the Wadatukat. And that plant is becoming extinct. And mostly the harvesting place is the beaches around Malheur and Harney Lakes, and it's hard to find now. Uh, there's a little bit of it growing along the Malheur River, but it's scarce. And as a result of it being scarce, there's not much harvest. And because we're not harvesting it, our young people are not knowing how to prepare it. And it's something that's going to be lost eventually if our environmental efforts don't beef up and we start to look at the vegetation and the wildlife and the ability to provide water to those marshlands so that the geese will come in and land, that the ducks will nest there, that these things are happening. And... You know, and we've got uh, remains that washed up out of those lakes during that flood, and they were reburied on the Malheur Refuge because, you know, as tribal people, we didn't want to rebury them, you know, someplace way away from where they were. So the closest safe place for them was a refuge. And that was another thing that was enough to make a person angry. You have a person who dislikes the government, doesn't want the government to tell them what to do or anything, and they're riding back and forth on horseback in the middle of winter with an American flag, and I said, where's their little gang flag? What is it, the snake on the yellow background or something? And I said, that's the flag they should carry. I said, I've got relatives. And I said, we've always been proud of our military service. And I said, no matter how people treat us or whatever, I said, Native American people stood up. And when I graduated in Oklahoma in 1964, there were two bus buses in front of the auditorium 
After graduation, the boys left their cap and gown, diploma, whatever, and got on the bus and went to Fort Polk. And I said, you know, we had a graduating class of 110 people, and about half of them were boys, and all most of them were drafted, and they went. And I said, you know, I said, Indian people are very proud of being a warrior, being a defender of our lands and our country. And I said, when people like the militants come in, I said, I was very offended with it. And I said, if you don't like the government, don't wave the flag. It doesn't make sense to me. You know, if you're feeling that these people are, are ruining your life, ruining your ability to get back the land that belonged to the ranchers or whatever, you know, you can't, uh, um, have it both ways, I guess. And I know when Mr. Finnicum died, the next morning I got a phone call, a very irate lady from over on the other side of the mountains, maybe Eugene, I think she said she was from, or Springfield, someplace over there. And, of course, she called me a derogatory name and said, are you happy now? He's dead. And I told him, I said, I told her, I said, you know, you're talking to a tribal person. I said, we don't find joy in death. I said, we know that that person's gone into the next world, that that person is at peace with whatever was disrupting his life here in, the, in this world. And I said, that's the only thing I'm thankful for, is that he was a very miserable person. And you could tell it by his actions and his feelings of being persecuted and all of that stuff. And I said, it's gone now. And I said, he's in a good place. And then they came a couple days later. They put up this memorial and, and alongside the highway up in the woods where he was shot. And then it was all over the Internet that Tribal people went up there and tore down their memorial and did this and that. And so my response to that was, we're tribal people. I said, whenever one of our people dies, whether it be in a car wreck or, or something happens and there's blood on the ground, I said, we have somebody cleanse that area before we even touch it. And I said, no self-respecting tribal person would go up there in the middle of the night, three feet of snow, plus whatever the bulldozer, I mean the road plows had piled up, sub-zero weather. I said, we're not going to go up there and mess around with something like that. And, uh, you know, but they, they, they kept wanting to get us to react to something in a, in a negative way so that I guess they could maybe focus everything on us or I don't know. But it was a real strange uh, time and it was really difficult. And I know that a lot of people still have uh, uncertain feelings. And I think with the change in the national administration and tribal people not knowing where they stand. Um, the uh, decision on the pipeline and those sorts of things are really scary for Native people um, that our rights are not regarded that the federal government, as it is now, the administration, is not paying attention to the regulations that they have set forth, that they have said, okay, this is a guideline. In order to do this, you need to get uh, 
the federal regulation 106, which talks about the archaeological value of the land, all these things that have to be taken care of and examined before you can do any construction or change things. And I said, you know, when you see these things and, and you read about historically the inability of the government to follow through on treaties, on agreements that have made been made with the tribal people and stuff. And this looks the same way. You know, my money is more important. It's more important than I sell that oil. It's not important if everybody downstream has contaminated water or that children are getting diseases because fracking has released arsenic into water supplies and stuff like that. Who cares? You know, we got our money. We're going to sell this oil to China or somebody and we're going to get richer and those people are just going to have to deal with it. And you look at the number of times just even since the protest started, the contamination that has been happening systematically, you know, about once a month you have something blows up, something spills, some, there's a big cleanup on some. And, you know, in the Northwest we look at, you know, the um, availability of fish, which is a, a primary food source for the Northwest tribes. And, you know, they're floating around in the Columbia River bellies up. Something is bothering or contaminating the water. You know, we don't know. Maybe it's the dams that's doing it. You know, you can only spin around so many times in a turbine before it has effect on you. And, you know, it... Um, you know, and it's it's happening all over. You know, what happens at Hungry Horse Dam in Montana and what happens to the fish that go up there to spawn and they go down through the vortex and the sides of the dams and they spin around and they spin out the other side. Then they head for Canada and they're in Canada for a while going through Canada's dams and we're paying Canada to block our water so that it doesn't flood Spokane or someplace like that. And uh, they're generating power, whatever, and we're paying them to generate power for Canada and stuff. And, you know, I've been involved with the Columbia River Treaty and uh, sat in on a lot of their meetings. And the fact that when these Grand Coulee Dam, these dams were built back in the 40s, whatever, nobody cared about the environment. But now when you come around and you're trying to get those people to include the environment in the renewal of the treaty, those sorts of things are very important and they need to be taken into consideration because there are going to be no fish any kind of fish. And so we're going to lose a food source, we're going to lose an economic source, you know, for the commercial fishermen and people that uh, depend on those salmon in the Columbia River. They're going to miss out. And, you know, and, and, and in this time, you know, the employment the economy is very important to some people. And regardless of the stakes, regardless of what the after effects are, we've got to make the money. And we're seeing the same thing in our area where the state of Oregon, the tribe had uh, the allotment association. Uh, we protested Oregon uh, division of lands because they were going to put three big 18 inch irrigation wells uh, in close proximity to tribal lands or tribal owner owned lands. And uh, 
we got them to only put in one, which was okay, but, but you know, these 18-inch wells are sucking the water out from the people living on top of the land, bumping mud some places. Uh, we don't know what the aquifers are or how many layers of water there are under the ground. And the thing is, these people aren't feeding cattle with it. They're growing all this hay. They're packing it up and shipping it to China or someplace else. And none of these big hay producers own cows. And I said, I grew up, my parents worked uh, on ranches. My mom cooked for hay crews and buckaroos and everybody. And that was our life. I said, those people had a lot of land. And I said, the ranches grew hay. They kept the hay, they fed it to their cows, they sold their cows, they put up more hay the next year. And I said, it was a cycle that I'm growing this hay to take care of my cattle so then I'll have an income and be self-supporting. It wasn't, I'm going to grow all this hay and sell it to so-and-so over here and make a profit. You know, and, you know, that's not the way things operate in this day and age. And, you know, it's sad to see that lifestyle go by the wayside and that people are greedy and looking at their bank accounts rather than what's happening to the land. And I said, you know, we depend a lot on snowpack, runoff, flood irrigation, those sorts of things. And I said, with climate change happening, we don't get snowpack the way we used to. Things aren't the same as always. And I said, you can see the land actually changing. And I said, until people recognize it and say, we need to manage the water, we need to control the water usage. And I, I belong to the Harney County Water Planning <laughs> uh, group. And it's a real, a real problem. And you know, the more I'm involved with that, the more I'm learning about the water and how important it is. I know it's important. It's important to me as a tribal person. Um, but, you know, it, it just, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that there are so many people here because it's not always easy to let people know I'm a tribal person. I have tribal interests in climate change. I have tribal interests in the environment. And it says down here to speak for the water, the plants, the wildlife, those sorts of things. In uh, traditional prayers, a lot of times when you listen to these prayers, the, the person that's leading the prayer will, will talk about the feathered, the animals that live in the water. All of these things are covered in these prayers and that, you know, the, the water, the soils, the vegetation is there to keep these animals and everything alive. But uh, I'll kind of leave it at that, I think, uh, and give people time if there's questions or anything that you have an interest in or would just like to know whatever, you know, I'm, I'm willing to share what I can with you. So, if there are questions, I can take a microphone. And or I could use the microphone first to tell you that I would bring you the microphone so you could be heard when you ask the question. So anyone who I could... Bring this to. Any questions? Okay, good. I'm very nimble. I'll be there very fast.
Thank you for coming first. Thank you. And I'm wondering, because we are in a very divisive time within our nation, do you see that this is perhaps uh, a forerunner of other kinds of actions that are going to happen? And I, I would assume that would be of great concern to you. But how how can your example of how you live through that situation be spread so that people understand um, that nonviolently you approached what was potentially a very, very violent situation? Well... For one thing, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to take a whole community of people who are being uh, threatened and vi with violence and to keep them calm and to keep them focused on, we don't need to do that. You know, we have the spirituality, we have the support of a lot of people. and you know, that empowers us. These people are confused. These people uh, don't know what they're doing, actually. Uh, they're not realistic. The goals that they have, they can't accomplish. Um, what they do is against the law. You know, they wanted to give me a truckload of artifacts. If I had taken those artifacts and there was no chain of possession recorded in accordance with the regulations, I would have been just as guilty as they were. And, um, you know, and I think that people think that by shouting and being the loudest and whatever that it makes you strong. It doesn't. You know, and I think that tribal people recognize that, you know, we need to be consistent and resistant, but we don't need to go out and shoot anybody or to confront them. You know, we, we spirituality, I think, is what really carries us through. And... Um, when the occupation was over, uh, we had a healing ceremony. And we called and notified people, come in, we're going to do a sunrise ceremony to cleanse the area of the wildlife refuge from the spirit that was there when the uh, militia was there. And... Um, it had rained probably nonstop for two weeks. The morning of the sunrise ceremony, it was cold. It was so cold and windy, but there was a sunrise. And the sky was clear, everything. Uh, one of the young men that was in attendance, they, were, they had uh, finished the ceremony and at the end, they were offering the last prayer song. And it kind of went like that to me and pointed up. There were six eagles in the sky. And they were so high up that you could just barely see them, and they were circling. And they came down close. And two of them stayed at the tower. The other four took off in different directions across the marshes, the flatlands everything and it's probably a, a good 20 miles across and by the time that that song had finished uh, they were back and they were sitting in the trees above the where the drum was and I said you know I said to me and to any and we had a lot of tribal people there um, I said it's a good sign our prayers are heard and something's going to happen. And, um, you know, we we were able to reconstruct and, and uh, work with the uh, fish and wildlife people to restore 
you know, some organization to the facility and stuff. And, and you know, and I think it's really important that we, as people have faith, no matter what your beliefs are or, or whatever, um, just have faith that there is a power and it gives us guidance and we're going to be strong together. And it doesn't matter if you're a tribal person or what you are, we're going to be strong and we're going to overcome these deficiencies in the way things are handled, the way the country is going, the uh, events that come up and, you know, and I think our biggest struggle right now is to, maybe we won't get anywhere with the pipeline, but it's something that people are aware of and, you know, is, is tribal people, the environmental people, people that care about the country and the plants and whatever, you know, we're going to be strong because I think our focus is right. You know, we don't want to see all the salmon die. We don't want to see moose and whatever die for lack of feed because somebody sprayed everything with some chemical or some chemical spilled and it couldn't grow anymore or something. And it's something that affects everybody in this country. It's not just the tribal people. And I, I like to think that as a tribal person and growing up back in the 40s when people were more traditional in their beliefs and stuff, and the things I did as a, as a child, you know, I'd go out in the marshes and I'd make a, an egg basket out of tulis. And it's just a little quick thing you kind of weave up and it makes a little bag and you carry it along and you go through the marshes and you find duck nests and there might be three or four eggs in there, you take one. And we were always told, you only take one. You leave one to grow. You leave two for the predators, maybe the raccoons or somebody's going to come along and eat those baby ducks. But one of them's going to survive. And those are our ducks for the next year. And that you respect that. And you don't get greedy and go in and say, hey, I found four eggs and take them all. And the mother comes back and there's no babies or no eggs. And, you know, and the way we do these things, you know, there's things that uh, are going on right now. Jackrabbits, another one of our primary sustenance. Um, they're mating right now. So... You know, they'll run up and jump on you practically, but you don't kill them and you don't eat them because they need to have their babies so that we have more rabbits. Um, antelope we kill in probably mid-June. Uh, the babies are usually born May, early June, and the buck antelope separate from the females when they have their offspring. So that's the time you hunt antelope. They don't have the rut, they don't have the strong taste, they don't have the smell, their glands haven't developed anything, and it's good meat. And when we hunt deer, these things are done in late July, early August, because the winds are hot and dry, sun doesn't go behind the clouds very much, and you can dry your provisions. And I said, you know, nowadays uh, a lot of tribes are adopting the non-Indian way of uh, hunting and, and, and things, and I said, it doesn't work. And I said, if things are gotten too late in the season and the rains start to come in September, you can't dry meat. And I said, you know, uh, we as tribal people are conscious of the environment and we use the plants and things. 
I know that when certain plants are blooming, it's a time to harvest a certain type of animal. And, you know, and these are customs and, and practices that our people have lived by for generations. And nowadays you can't do that because the um, um, regulations and all the things that are happening uh, makes it difficult. But, you know, we, we as tribal people have been taught basic environmental concerns. I know as a little girl I used to go with my old grand aunt up on the mountain to gather medicines and, and various things. And there was a, a spring way up, um, just a, a place in the rock set. And of course it was covered with watercress. There were plants in there, the little black bugs were swimming, walking across the water and stuff. She always told me, she said, you know, you'd get excited after you climbed up this mountain and stuff, and you'd have your cup and you'd be ready to dip it in the spring and get something to drink. And she'd tell me, you wait. She said, you get a stick. She said, you push this watercress aside. You don't whack it, whatever. Don't disturb the roots. The roots are in the mud, whatever is down underneath the spring water. And she said, once it separates and you haven't disturbed it, dip your cup in there and get water. But, you know, you were always excited about doing something, but there was always somebody to tell you, we don't do it that way. You know, you pay attention to this. Don't pull those plants out and kill them. Um, you know, you, you pay attention to what's going on around you. Any more questions? Or? Maybe um, one, and then I'm hoping that you'll hang around a little bit afterwards for individuals who might want to chat with you, but we'll get one more question here from, uh, where have you gone? Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay. I was just wondering if during the occupation, um, if I know you said that sometimes you got really heated. I was just wondering if there were any like younger people of the younger generation that you ever had to like calm down or like talk some sense uh, into. A lot of them wanted to react. Um, we had an incident in uh, McDonald's. Militia people came in and sort of pushed one of the tribal members around. And, you know, and this was one guy by himself in McDonald's and to try to intimidate him, um, you know, and they're all armed and everything. And he was lucky that another older tribal member happened to come in and was able to get him out of that situation. We had another incident at one of the, the drug stores. Somebody had gone in to get medications or something, and the guys kept following him around in the, the drug store and followed him out. And two of the other guys had were waiting outside the front door, and it was just a sort of a push and shove kind of thing. And uh, the tribal person didn't react because his niece was there and she was able to keep him away from a real confrontation. But it was pretty, uh, it was pretty hard. And I know, you know, my, my daughters and my children were concerned. My son went, was in Portland for something. He came back with a big, uh, uh, camera system for my house and everything. And uh, my youngest son said, Mom said, he was going back to Montana. He said, is there anything you need before I go? And I told him, I said, probably more ammunition. <laughs> and, um, you know, living up in the country where we live, we do a lot of hunting. We've been around guns all our lives. And and those sorts of things. And I said, you know, I said, I've done the best I can in this world. And 
I said, I'm not afraid. And uh, I said, you know, whatever happens, happens. And I said, we need to have faith that the best is going to be happening. But those were the only two incidents that could have uh, erupted into something more serious. And I'm sure that if something had happened, those families uh, would have been there and it would have gotten out of hand. But um, I think, you know, through prayer and a lot of uh, uh, sharing why we don't need to act this way, why we don't aren't going to do this, was real important. The other thing is that traditionally grandmas have the respect of the rest of the community and that was helpful. <laughs> but if grandma had a stick and started poking somebody in the ribs and saying, you go over there and punch that guy in the nose, I said, I'm sure they would have done it. <laughs> well, um. Chairwoman Roderick, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for giving us so much to contemplate and savor and steer by in some kind of unpredictable times on the horizon right. here. So thank you for giving us our bearings on this occasion. Well, I want to tell everybody I appreciate their attendance and their interest because there's a lot more coming. And we need to prepare, all of us, for these issues as they arise. And I think they're going to be centered on the environment. Thank you.